Hi, Emmanuel. I'm Cindy, here to bring you the announcements. Emmanuel is hosting a 24-hour prayer vigil. Together, we will praise, thank, and ask God for ongoing guidance and strength. We will put Jesus' words into practice as we continue to grow in faith, boldness, and obedience. The prayer vigil will continue the Red Letter Challenge, and all are welcome and all prayers are appreciated. The prayer vigil will run for 24 hours from Saturday, November 9th at 7.30 a.m. until Sunday, November 10th at 7.30 a.m. You can sign up through the Emanuel Minute. Around 700 surveys were completed. The surveys and your nominations for lead pastor candidates were sent to the district. On October 27th, following the 11 a.m. service, Reverend Rob Casper from the district will present the results. He will lead a discussion to make sure the survey creates a good profile of Emmanuel and what we are looking for in our next lead pastor. Trunk and Treat is an annual fun event and it's coming this Saturday. Come dress up and have fun. Families are encouraged to hand out candy from their cars and decorate their trunks. The best decorated theme of the trunk wins a prize. There are snacks, games, a bonfire, music, and fun. You can sign up to volunteer and register for the event at our website at immlutheran.org slash trunk and treat. Have a blessed week. Well, good morning. I'm uh, Pastor Nikolai. It's good to be with you. Pastor Michael is going to be bringing God's word for us later uh, in the service, but welcome. So good to have you. We are kind of uh, going through this Red Letter Challenge series and actually kind of like uh, almost land in the plane at this point. Um, and uh, we're talking about going in discipleship and uh, how God has called us to be his people in this world. And so what an awesome uh, privilege that is. Uh, but uh, we're glad to be gathered together, you know, in the presence of God where we receive his love and forgiveness. Take a moment, fill out that Connect card. Uh, you'll find that in the bulletin. Uh, there's also a lot of other good stuff in the bulletin there as well. And uh, if you're a guest with us, uh, I know your experience is going to be uh, a warm, uh, loving family here at Emmanuel. And so uh, it's good to have you as our guest. And simply uh, just let us know. Uh, mark that you're our guest in the Connect card. We just want to send you a thank you because it's really good to have you with us this morning. Also, if you're joining us online, it's good to have you as well uh, worshiping with us. And uh, take a moment, check in on social media, let your friends and family know you're here. It's a good way to just get the love of Jesus out there. And if they're looking for a place to experience faith and life together, they can do it with you. Or if you're going to Trunk and Treat this coming Saturday, invite everyone on social media that you know to come and join you. You know, do something crazy like that. See who shows up. But uh, our social media is IMM Lutheran uh, if you want to get connected with our things. Uh, but we're going to begin worship with... Uh, uh, time of confession. And uh, why this is important is because God, in his word, really leads us and convicts us in ways that uh, we need to grow, ways that we are, are broken before him. And one of those is we talk about going. Uh, I think sometimes we just uh, think the Christian life is like, well, uh, maybe that's just, uh, you know, what the pastor does. Or, or like, I just, I, I kind of show up on Sunday morning and I do my thing. But really, God is calling us, all of his people, to, to make disciples. That's our calling, to, to grow the church, to be God's people in the world. And sometimes uh, we don't live up, uh, we fail on that responsibility. Every single one of us does. And so we come with that heart of confession um, and seek his forgiveness. And so together, uh, let's start by saying these words. Jesus, forgive us for when we fail to hear and respond to your authority, when we don't go and make disciples when we fail to grasp the full grace of our baptism, when we don't live out what you teach or teach others your ways, forgive us and renew us. Jesus, our crucified and risen King, he hears our confession and with all authority declares over you and to me, your sins are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, receive that grace and continue to follow Jesus and be empowered to go and make disciples. Amen. Let's stand for our opening worship. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. Oh, it does. 
grace is indeed enough, and uh, that happens through the waters of baptism where we are, are washed, not just uh, outwardly, uh, which we need as well, but, but more importantly, inwardly, uh, that we are purified and cleansed through uh, the blood of the cross and through Jesus and, and that baptismal promise through this simple water, but with the powerful word of God, uh, he brings us into his family. And that's going to happen for a uh, little Madeline this morning where he brings us into or where he brings her into God's family. And this is something that has happened to us in our baptism as well. And we affirm our common faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, this is a creed that we were baptized into. This is our faith and foundation of us as God's people. And so uh, we say these words together. 
uh, as Madeline is about to be brought into the waters of baptism, but remembering your baptism as well. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, as you two uh, bring your beloved daughter to the waters of baptism this morning, uh, you know it's more than just uh, today. You know, it's this lifelong commitment to uh, raising her in the faith and reminding her of what Jesus has done for her on this day and uh, bringing her to worship and uh, reading the word of God to her and praying for her. And as if this is your commitment as parents, then say yes, with the help of God. Awesome. And as a big brother, are you going to love your sister and pray for her? Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> and sponsors as well. You have such a great uh, responsibility and job to just love her as well and pray for her and continue to uh, show her the love of Jesus. And if this is your uh, commitment, then say yes with the help of God. Awesome. Madeline, I mark the sign of the cross upon your forehead. And upon your heart is one who has been redeemed by Jesus. If you want to hold her over the baptismal font here, Madeline Grace Marks, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Here, can you hold that for your sister? Madeline, your name means prayerful. How cool is that? From 1 Corinthians, I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will also sing with the understanding. What a beautiful baptismal verse. Our elder here is lighting a candle, just like we like to celebrate a birthday. Um, this is uh, even more a birthday where God has brought her into eternal life. And so my encouragement for you guys is uh, light this candle every year and uh, make her a cake. She's going to love that. And uh, really celebrate because uh, God has done something incredible for her on this day. So let's pray for her as uh, God's people. Uh, you'll see that on the screen. Father, we thank you for the life you've given and her eternal life through Jesus. We pray that each day she will grow and appreciate how you are working in her life and in the world. Help us surround her with the love and hope that Jesus has shown us. Show to her now and forever your grace and mercy as the source of her life. Amen. Well, let's say welcome to the family, Madeline. Welcome to the family, Madeline. <laughs> Congratulations. You can blow out the candle, and uh, here, I'll let you take this as well, and you can head back to your seats. We're going to lift up uh, the prayers of our community and the prayers of this place uh, to our God, and as you always do, uh, pray with me the first name of the people that appear on the screen. Uh, dear Lord, you have called us and equipped us uh, to go into this world. And uh, everywhere that our feet walk, everything that our hands touch, uh, let that be a place where your love and your grace are shown. And uh, where we have failed, uh, build us up. And uh, let us keep seeking you in that. Uh, Lord, we ask that your, your healing hand will be with those who are hospitalized or those who need to see your healing and goodness. Uh, this morning, Lord, we especially pray for Bryn, Jackie, Jackie, Joy, Otto, Eileen, Bob, Gerald, Beckham, George, Bernadette, Renee, Paul, Sandra, Tom, Helen, Kenneth, Christy, Sherry, and Tim. We also uh, ask that your Easter victory and your Easter peace uh, would be with these family and these friends of these loved ones at this time. Uh, Lord, together we lift up the friends and family of Jean, Eileen, and William. We also ask uh, for just a celebration and joy for the life you have given as we uh, rejoice in these two. Lord, together this morning we pray for 
John and Bonnie. We also lift up uh, marriages and weddings, and especially for these two as they're preparing to be married this Friday. Uh, bless their preparations and uh, their life together ahead. Uh, Lord, together we pray for Francesca and Nicholas. We also lift up uh, these anniversaries that you continue to strengthen and guide them in the marriage. Lord, together this morning we pray for Glenn and B, Steve and Katie, Terry and Kathy. We also lift up the uh, missionaries we support around the world as you've called us to go to all nations, uh, to Tim and Beth as they uh, serve you and serve your people there. We pray for our Lutheran Women's Missionary League. They do incredible things for your kingdom and continue to bless their work as they seek you and as the Holy Spirit uh, moves and works through them in uh, incredible ways. We pray for Mohegan High School uh, as they are such a, a great part of this community. And we also pray for St. Luke as they are also an incredible part of that community in Clinton Township for their church and their school. And Lord, we remember that as you've called us to, to go into the world, uh, that is for every single one of us. And so uh, bless our conversations. Uh, bless us where we are in our families and in our workplaces where uh, we can show and others can see your love through us. We ask this in your name. And together, Lord, we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Kids, come on up here front here for the Kids Minute. All right, here we go. I have something super cool to show you. Here we are. Good morning, how are you? All right, so I wanna show you something. It's in my shoe. R what? What? At least you're not plugging your nose yet. That's good, right? Look, look at my feet. What do you think? They're kind of long and skinny, aren't they? Uh-huh, I have big feet, I do. I have big feet, but you know what? It, uh, the reason why I'm showing you my feet because one of my favorite Bible verses has to do with feet. In the Bible it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who share good news about Jesus. It says they're beautiful feet. Do you guys think I have beautiful feet? Yeah, no, not really, right? Well, it doesn't really mean that if you look at your feet, do you have beautiful feet? What it means is if you stand on the Word of God. It doesn't mean stand on the Bible. It doesn't mean I would take a Bible and stand on it. It means if you teach and tell other people what the Bible says and you stand firm, it means if you really teach them the truth, then you have beautiful feet. Look at your feet. I know you have shoes on. Don't take your shoes off, but look at your feet. When you do take them off when you get home, I want you to look. And they might not be pretty feet, but when you tell your friends and other people about Jesus, God says you have beautiful feet. Who are some people in your life that have beautiful feet? Maybe your parents, they tell you about Jesus. Our pastors, they have the best feet ever, right? Beautiful feet. <laughs> anybody, anybody that is, it teaches you in kids' ministry. So God says... You have beautiful feet. What do you think? Pretty cool, huh? Let's pray about it. Fold your hands. Close your eyes. I'll get my shoe on when we're done, I promise. You ready? Everybody pray with me. You know, I want to tell you one more thing. Sometimes we do get stinky feet because we sin, right? But Jesus covered our sin, and we can be thankful that we still have beautiful feet because of what Jesus did for us. Isn't that amazing? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word and letting us tell people about Jesus. Thank you for my beautiful feet, and when they get stinky, for forgiving me and helping me to love. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, shout it, go.
Nice. All right, you guys can head back. Thanks for coming yes. up. <laughs> we give back to God because he is so good to us, and uh, he is committed everything for us. His mission, his plan from the very beginning of time was to win you back. And he has given us everything we have. And so we give back to him. And uh, as we give back to him, uh, we're going to be playing a video. And this is a mission partnership that's been uh, forming and has formed for the last several years now. And it's exciting to see how uh, really the church us as God's people, uh, we are not really uh, bound by any borders. It is a, is a call to all nations. And so to see the work that we get to do with Guatemala and the ways that they get to bless us as well has uh, been incredible. And so uh, at this time, as we get back to God um, and also place those connect cards in the plate as well as it goes by, uh, check out this video. I, I personally I struggled with the whole premise of the mission, you know, we weren't going down to build something or do something as you normally think a mission is supposed to be like. But the minute we stepped foot there, met the people on the ground and actually got to the school, the, the mission became clear about that we were walking side by side with, with God's people. They're, they're, they're people just like us. I think what we found was it was everything I expected it to be and nothing I had expected it to be. It was definitely an emotional roller coaster. Uh, you get to play with the kids and see the kids and, and hug on them and love on them. And then you go back and you kind of reflect at night um, their living conditions and tend to start to feel guilty of all that we have and uh, you know how little they live with but yet they're so happy. The opportunity we had to meet with our um, Adriana is our prayer partner um, was a little bit different from the other members of the group. Uh, the people down there um, had to do some digging as to where our little child would actually spend the nights and spend the days that she wasn't in school. Uh, it was shared with us that her, she never had a father. Her mother abandoned her when she was one. It was kind of loosely interpreted that, you know, she doesn't have a whole lot of supervision and she's a first grader. 90% of the kids there, that's their reality. Um, I mentioned that I wish we could adopt her, you know, and knowing that that's not a reality. And he said, well, then we need to have 90% of this community adopted. The thing that really struck me the most was when it was time to give an offering. And when we had been with these people um, this whole time and they literally have nothing and every single one of them got up and gave an offering um, to their God. And that was just very impactful just to see them, see the importance of that. So when you start to pull our whole experience together when you see the the leadership training that was happening in the classrooms from Eric and Deborah, uh, the food program, the prayers, um, education, all those things put together, they're pieces of the puzzle that are gonna make their chances of success just get bigger and bigger. And uh, you, you can start to see the hope that they soon, or that they have, and that we'll only get uh, bigger and better as we step up and, you know, and, and take a bigger role in helping this community. Uh, your generosity to God uh, makes things like this possible is uh, here at Emmanuel. We're just continuing to seek his will and uh, always do his work in this world. Um, if you want to hear more about Hope Chest, uh, there's a trip uh, coming this spring, or even if like a trip isn't viable for you right now uh, in your life, uh, you can still sponsor a child. And I know my wife and I are doing that, and it's, uh, it's incredible. And so you can hear more about that like straight out through those doors after service uh, in uh, Ministry Room 1, and uh, the Hope Chest team would be glad to share more with you about that. We live in an interactive world where new social media challenges pop up all the time. Some for enjoyment, some for a good cause, others are just plain dangerous. What if you tried a new challenge? 
one that could transform your life, community, and the world. What if you spent 40 days studying Jesus' words and applying his teachings to everyday life, all focused on five principles, being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going like Christ. So what are you waiting for? Let's join together and take the Red Letter Challenge. Uh, we're uh, kicking off the last week of the Red Letter Challenge, and uh, these are uh, the words we're going to be digging into from Jesus in Matthew uh, 28. These are the red letters that we're going to be talking about. So I encourage you to grab a Bible right in front of you or under the, uh, the chair. Uh, go to page um, 835, or if you've got a phone, open up your phone, go to your Bible app, Matthew chapter 28. We're going to begin at verse 11. So Matthew 28, verse 11, 835. Uh, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And if you bump your eyes up, uh, you'll see what had taken place is the resurrection. Jesus walking out of that tomb. And the angel showing up. And so they told the chief priests that. And when they, the chief priests, had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell the people, tell them this, his disciples came by night and stole Jesus away while we, you soldiers, were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we, the chief priests, the elders, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the guards took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when the disciples saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hold your Bibles open there. We'll jump back to that uh, in, in a minute. As I mentioned, we're kind of like, Launching into the last week, so if you've been following along, you should be on day 34, kicking off going. Um, but I wanted to start with the question that Nick and I have been asking you guys, and that's simply, how's it going? How's the Red Letter Challenge going? Or do you have things to celebrate? Has God shown up in any way? On Saturday, uh, one of the members came up to me afterwards and was saying how God has shown up for her and the cell, like the winds during this red letter challenge. And if that's you, I want to hear about it. Nikolai wants to hear about it. Because next week, we're doing a whole week of just celebrating Jesus and celebrating God's work in and through us. Or maybe it's been a struggle. You've fallen behind on the readings. Don't give up. Keep reading. Or some of the challenges you just couldn't quite get to. If you're struggling, I want to hear about that as well. I can share with you my struggles. And we together, right, that's why we have one another, so we can encourage each other to keep going, to keep digging into the red letters of Jesus and living them, living them out. And as I was working on uh, the message today, I was like, I need to come up with a cool phrase to like empower us to, to, to you know, as Nick I said, land this plane. And so I thought, finish strong. But then I thought, I don't want this to finish, Right? I don't want this to be like 40 days of hearing and responding to Jesus and then not doing it anymore. I want this to be like a catalyst for us individually and as a community of Jesus followers. A launching pad to be more intentional about following Jesus. To be more intentional about being his disciples. So I don't want us to finish strong. I want this to be like a catalyst. A starting point. For us, And so maybe a better phrase would be, you know, like, be commissioned or go forth or like, let's go. And I get that this challenge has been a challenge. It's called a challenge for a reason. And uh, the keep going, make this a part of your everyday life is maybe daunting and sounds impossible. And on our own, you're right, it is. 
Uh, last year, I got to hear this author speak. He wrote a book called Canoeing the Mountains. I don't know if you've ever uh, read it. It's a leadership book. It's a fantastic book. But he retells the story of Lewis and Clark. And uh, Lewis and Clark, they were charged with finding the waterway from, uh, you know, the East Coast to uh, the West Coast. And they make it to the headwaters of the Missouri River. And they believe that just over this ridge will be another river, the rest of the waterway to get to the Pacific Ocean. They get to the ridge. Guess what they see? The Rocky Mountains, guys. Not a nice, docile river. This huge, I mean, they're used to the Appalachian Mountains. Those are mountains, but that's, they're not the Rocky Mountains. They're prepared to canoe, not traverse a mountain. So they have a choice. Do we go back to our old life and just say we failed? We couldn't complete the mission. Or do they stare down the Rocky Mountains, these grand, glorious mountain range, and say, we have a mission. And so we're going forth. We're not going back. And for us, right, we're, we're on this ridge, and today Jesus is pointing out, laying before us, the Rocky Mountains, our mission, and it's huge, and it's massive, and it's daunting, and it's terrifying, but it's also good, and it's also glorious, and we need to decide, are we going back to the way life was? Sunday's just a check mark. Jesus, I'll come back next week. Are we going to see this mission, this adventure, this life that Jesus is laying before us and saying, let's go? My prayer for myself and for you is we can't go back. That we resolve that we are going for, we're stepping into the mountains, going on this great adventure with Jesus, this mission that will be accomplished in him. And he lays out that mission in Matthew 28. So grab your Bibles, guys. 835. I had to start at verse 11 uh, because it's a text we don't usually get into, uh, but I feel like it lays out the context for what we're about to read. And um, uh, the context is the resurrection, the empty tomb. And I think Matthew puts this in here as an apologetic to solidify the truth of the empty tomb. Because here's what the text says. Even Jesus' enemies say that tomb is empty. We do not have a dead body. And so we're going to come up with a lie, fake news, and say that the disciples came and stole away. But we know the truth. The disciples didn't come to Jesus. They were off hiding. Jesus went to them because he, he's bigger. He's stronger than the grave. He's greater than everything this world can throw at him. Like that's the truth of the resurrection. His sacrifice was accepted. It is sufficient for the sins of the whole world. That empty tomb means that he reigns supreme over everything. And by everything, I mean everything falls under him because of that empty tomb. Because there's no body there. That's the context. That's the scenario that we're stepping into as we look at these closing words of Jesus to his disciples then and for us today. And so go to verse 16. Now the 11 disciples, it used to be 12, but Judas betrayed, and now he's no longer one of the 12. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. Now, these are good Jewish men. They only worship the one true God. And so here, Matthew reveals, this is the way the disciples viewed Jesus. He is God in flesh, worthy of our worship. And so they, they fall down and they, they worship him. But check what it says next. But some doubted. I, when I was working through this, I found that oddly comforting. And, and here's why. These are eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. These are, these are men who walked with Jesus for three years. And they struggle with doubt. 
brothers and sisters, we're 2,000 years removed. And I'm a pastor, and maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I still struggle with doubt. And I'm sure I'm not alone. I mean, when life gets crazy and out of control and difficult, doubt creeps in. When I look out in this world and everything going on, doubt creeps in. When I read certain scripture passages, I just can't wrap my mind around it, right? Doubt creeps in. And so here's what I find comforting. I am not alone. If you are struggling with doubt, you are in good company. His closest followers struggled with doubt. And here's too what I find comforting. Even though they doubted, guess what? Jesus accepted their worship. Even though they doubted, he gave them the great commission. He still entrusted the mission of God to them. And so if you're struggling with doubt, you're here. Jesus accepts your worship. He still entrusts his mission to you. And also what I find so comforting is like the disciples lay out a pathway for my doubt. Like what do I do in my doubt? You do what the disciples did. They went to the mountain. They they came into Jesus' presence. Even though they doubted, they worshipped Jesus. Even though they doubted, they heard his word, his mission, and they responded. And the same is true for us. That in our doubts, not only were we not alone, but bring your doubts to Jesus. Continue to worship him. Continue to hear and respond to his, his word. He accepts it. And he still trusts you and me. It's just so profound, and I find it so comforting, and I pray you do too. Verse 18. And Jesus came, and he said to the eleven disciples, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, given to him by his Father, who he willingly submitted to, even though Jesus is equal in majesty and goodness and power in his godness. He submitted to the Father, and the Father gave him all authority, supreme over everything. And just think about who Jesus is. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the the world. He's the one that came in grace and truth. He's the one that's full of compassion and mercy and grace. He's the one that's full of goodness and power and might and patience and truth and justice. And he's the one in charge. And let me tell you, that is very good news. And that's how Jesus sets this whole thing up. Like a sandwich, right? He gives us incredible good news. Here's the mission. Here's the goal. Here's the command. And guess what? I've got more good news for you. And so because of his authority, everything has been given to him. He has the right to tell us what to do. And this is, this is it, guys. This is the mission. This is plan A. This is what everything is about. This is what, this is our purpose. This is why we exist individually. This is why we exist as a church. These are his last words. These are the marching orders of Jesus to his disciples. That's you and I today. And this is it. Go, therefore. And I know in our text, uh, it sounds like a command, right? This imperative, go. But actually, in the original Greek, it's a participle. Going. Maybe a better way to understand it is, as you go, or on your going, in your daily life, where I have put you and placed you, in your family, with your kids, or with your spouse, or with your siblings, on your going, as you're out with friends, As you're out in the community, as you're in your workplace, on your going, this isn't just a one day a week, only at certain times, in your everyday life, this is what you're going to do. He says this, go therefore and make disciples. This is, in Greek, in this passage, the only imperative, the only command. Make disciples disciples. That is what we are all about. Now, how in the world do we do that? Thankfully, Jesus is about to tell us, but I think it first begins with us being disciples. 
right? Disciples make disciples. That's why this red letter challenge can't stop here. Because at its core, this is a disciple. One who hears the words of Jesus and responds. Who follows after Jesus. Who hears and responds to Jesus. That's why this red letter challenge needs to be a catalyst so that on our going, in our everyday life, we are being with Christ. We're letting him tell us who we are, and he has all authority to do so. And we get to let him give us our value and our worth and our purpose. And then we live it out, that we are disciples, and so we receive his forgiveness. We are humble and repentant. And we receive that forgiveness, and we give it out. Now we need to be disciples first. We serve, we give, we go. We follow in Jesus' footsteps. That when we serve, when we give, when we go, when we forgive, when we receive forgiveness, when we are with Christ, we, we are entering into his heart and we are participating in his heart when we live this out. And I believe that's the first step in making a disciple because uh, the Apostle Paul says it this way. Imitate me as I imitate Jesus Christ. People will follow our examples. How we live is the process of making a disciple. And then he tells us here in the next, in the bottom half of this verse. But first he says, make disciples of who? All nations. And all nations includes all nations. And thankfully that's true because that's us, guys. If he didn't say all nations, we would not be here. And there are no boundaries around who Jesus wants as a disciple. It doesn't matter race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, political allegiance, lifestyle. Everyone is in the purview of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And now, today with technology and travel, not even physical location limits our process of making disciples. Again, you saw it in the the offering, and I'm going to encourage you again. I mean, that's what we're doing in Guatemala. Like, go next door. Talk to the Hope Chess team. Like, with this partnership, we're, we're living this out. They are all nations. And by going and being present with them, you're encouraging those indigenous leaders that are discipling these children. That when we go, I mean, guys, I had the honor of going and showing up to those classrooms and those kids, holy smokes. Just being present, letting them know that you are worth our time, that you are valuable to us. And even though there's a language barrier, guess what transcends language? The love of Jesus Christ the joy, the fun that he can bring just playing with those kids. Right? That's living it out and being an example to, to them. And so j- don't miss that opportunity. And honestly, I, I wouldn't be the disciple I am today. I actually wouldn't be a pastor today if I didn't go on mission trips and mission experiences. If I didn't experience all nation and, and God's heart for all nations. And so don't, don't miss this opportunity to go on that trip or to sponsor a kid because part of that sponsorship is discipleship material, this investment in in them. And so, how do we make disciples? Jesus tells us. Step one, verse 19, second half of 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what we just witnessed. The first step in discipleship. And here's what I love about it. That's God's step, right? It's his initiative. It always begins with him. The the process of making disciples is God showing up and saying, this one's mine. Of God showing up and giving that person forgiveness, giving that person the Holy Spirit, uniting that person to Jesus Christ, to his death and resurrection. That baptism is when he moves us from spiritual death to life. When God provides new life, that's how we make disciples. And it begins with him, his action, his initiative. But it doesn't end there. Verse 20, step two, teaching them to observe. Notice it's not just teach. 
teaching them to observe. That's action. That's activity. It's hearing the words of Jesus and responding to the words of Jesus. Observe all that I have commanded you. How many of you uh, parents do you remember bringing your child home from the hospital? Terrifying. I remember walking out, looking back, hoping somebody would stop me. Like, who's entrusting a child to me? This is a terrible idea. Right? But I have this new life. And parents, you know, you don't just bring your kid home and then do nothing, right? you got to invest in them. You love them. You nurture them. You teach them. You become a living example for them. The same is true with discipleship. We have spiritual children. They move from death to, to life. And discipleship is bringing those children home. It's investing them. It's walking alongside them. And guess what? It is terrifying. It's difficult. It's hard. But guess what? I bet if you ask any parent, they would say, it's worth it. Guys, making disciples, this is difficult. This is challenging. This is hard. But it is worth it. It is good. It is glorious. It's our purpose. This is, this is the pathway to fullness of life. Is hearing Jesus, being with Jesus, and then responding to his call, to his mission. Like, this is what we were made for. This is the adventure he's calling us out on. And it is the Rocky Mountains. Like, I get that. It's terrifying. But it is good. And it is glorious. And it's worth it. And before we get too overwhelmed, it's like Jesus knows he knows we're weak and we're feeble, that this is too much for us. He sandwiches it with some incredible good news. Listen to what he says last. He says, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now we step into those mountains. We go on this great adventure not alone. And maybe today... You feel alone. But this is the good news of the gospel. Jesus shows up. He meets you where you are and says, you are not alone. I'm with you. Not part of the time. Not when life's going well. Not when you're listening to me. But always. That when you and me, when, when we're struggling with doubt, we're doubting Jesus. He doesn't give up on us. He shows up and he says, I'm with you even now. I'm for you. And I still want you to do this. I still believe in you. When we are failing miserably, when sin is winning, we're giving in to our flesh. When we are failing to, to hear Jesus, when we are failing to respond to Jesus, he shows up and says, I'm with you. When we are overwhelmed and we feel like we have no idea what we are doing, especially when we're making disciples, Jesus shows up and says, I'm with you. I have all authority. You have access to all of my power, all of my authority, all of my goodness, all of my grace, all of my forgiveness. You are not alone. You can do this. You can do this, not because you're so great, not because you're so powerful and strong. But because I'm here, because I'm with you, because I've got you, I've got this. And so this is why this, this can't be the end, guys. Jesus is calling us farther into this great adventure. This is plan A. This is what it's all about. Are you going to go back? Are you going to let Jesus take you by the hand and march with him into the rocky mountains, into a life of being a disciple who makes disciples? That Jesus is here, right? That tomb is empty. He is alive. And the marching orders haven't changed. And I believe he's coming to each one of us, and he's saying, be commissioned. Go forth. I go with you. He's saying, Emmanuel, let's go. Amen. Let me pray.
Father in heaven, we're so grateful for you that we get to call you Father. And that's who we are because of your son, Jesus, because that cross is empty and that tomb is empty. And Jesus, help us to just cling to our baptism, that we have received your grace and we have received your spirit. And so fill us with your spirit. Take us by the hand so that we can go, that we can hear your words to make disciples and we can respond, that we can be with you, that we can receive and give your forgiveness, that we can serve, that we can give and so that we can go. On our own, we can't do this, but I'm so grateful that you, in all of your power, all of your authority, all of your goodness, all of your grace, you are with us. And so empower us to go. And I ask this, Jesus, in your precious and mighty name. Amen. When Jesus gives us that promise that he is with us always, I I know that this is one of the most powerful ways that that is true. Uh, in this meal of communion. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup. After he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new testament of my blood, which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We have this incredible gift and opportunity to receive the forgiveness and love of Jesus. Uh, In a few moments, we're going to have questions that will appear on the screen. This is what we believe God is doing for us here and now in this meal. And uh, as you read through these questions, as they prepare your heart and mind for communion, uh, if you say, yes, this is what I believe as well, uh, then we welcome you to the Lord's table here at Emmanuel. Uh, If you'd like gluten-free wafers or non-alcoholic wine, uh, we are glad to provide that. And uh, just simply request that as you come forward. Uh, I'd uh, like to invite all of the people who are worshiping in the balcony. uh, Start coming down and uh, making your way. And actually, you can get into line in preparation for communion on either of the side aisles. Um, And uh, after those in the balcony have communed, uh, then starting from the front and moving backwards, uh, we'll commune here on the the main level. I'd like to invite my uh, communion servers forward and welcome to the Lord's table.
Savior Jesus Christ, may it strengthen and preserve you in faith to life everlasting. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine in you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace always. Amen. Uh, just a reminder, uh, Hope Chest, if you're interested in hearing more about that, a ministry room one right outside. Also, the uh, Lutheran Women's Missionary League uh, table is right outside as well if you want to hear more about what they do or if you want to get involved. But uh, shake a hand, uh, get to know the people around you, share a name, and go out into his world. Be his disciple, share his love. Have a great day.